Well, every now and then, I catch up with Mark Perchtold, who is founding director of Omba Advisory and Investments, South African, who lives in London and has a global perspective on the world of investments. We're getting more insights from Mark in just a moment. Mark, as always, it's great to be tapping your brain. Last, uh, earlier this week, rather, I had a chance to talk to Charles Savage uh, from Purple Capital, uh, the, the owners of Easy Equities. And some time ago, Charles sent me a little statue of a bull and a bear. And it's really good because it reminds you what kind of market we're in. Of course, that's quite important if you're in a bull or a bear market. And I said to him, have you still got your bear on top? And he said, no, I'm so tired of it. I've moved, uh, just turned it upside down. So he says he's tired of the bear market. I think we're all tired of the bear market. But is it time to say that the bull is back on top? In other words, share prices trend-wise will be moving higher. What's your reading on this? It's very difficult, Alec, to, to be honest. I mean, if when we were in you know, one of our previous interviews last year, I spoke about the fact that we were adding risk to portfolios and, and overweighting some of the tech stocks, which would be beaten up through a, through a NASDAQ ETF. And it was much easier then, in our view, to read the market because things look cheap. They'd fallen meaningfully. Um, companies have guided earnings downwards meaningfully. And therefore, the scope for a beat and, and a better result was there. And we've started to see that come through now. So the stock markets have now run quite hard since October. And if you fast forward to the end of the year and you said, you know, my global equities are up 8 9% for the year, you'd be happy. And we've already had that in four months. So you could sell, as, as you, you, you mentioned before, you know, sell in May and go away and, and end the year up 8 or 9%. You know, it's actually a debate we had in our investment committee meeting this week, you know, capturing a lot of the return in, the, in this first quarter period. Um, has meant it's much harder now because there's still so much uncertainty out there. The good news is, and, and why maybe we're inclined to be more bullish than bearish, if we were to pick a side of that camp, we'd err on the side of being bullish, is that valuations haven't quite got, and certainly for the rest of the world, they haven't quite got to where um, they're showing some long-term trailing 10-year averages. You know, you're not seeing valuations overly extended. They're slightly cheap. But the U.S. stock market has moved right back up to what many would say is fair value. So what that means is that you can expect sort of mid-single-digit returns over the next five to ten years from U.S. equities. But that path is not linear. As we all know, markets oscillate up and down. There are plenty of uncertainties out there right now. And so I think the way the year will probably unfold is you will have continued headlines of blobs and companies failing uh, potentially more banking crises in it with some of the regional banks in the US or around the world. And so those those negative headlines won't go away. But there's almost like a bifurcation in the world in that many of the mega cap large companies are posting earning beat, earnings beats and in su- some cases for the big tech names, modest growth, which is indicative of, you know, an environment where we're not in a deep recession. And, you know, are we going to go into a deep recession? Our view is no. Could we have a mild recession? Possibly, you know, the U.S. is growing just over one percent, so it's not firing on all cylinders. Employment data is great, you know, every, people have jobs, but you know, the the pinch from higher interest rates hasn't yet passed through fully, and I think because of that, you're going to see we've seen it now in the banking sector. You're going to start seeing it in in households and in corporate earnings where they're over levered and they've got a lot of debt and they need to service that debt at higher rates or refinance themselves. So we're not out of the woods to answer your question. But we, we've had such a pessimistic expectation last year in terms of the world's view on where things go. It hasn't materialized to be that bad. And therefore, we could just trend modestly upwards towards the end of the year with gyrations along the way. You know, a 5% correction here and there wouldn't be a surprise at all. Will there be a 20% correction? I it would be no. This is really interesting stuff because when you start unpacking a lot of what you said a moment ago, We see today that the banks in America have posted record earnings for the first quarter of the year. So they are making money like they've never made money before. But on the other hand, there's a lot of warnings about the commercial property market in the United States and clearly elsewhere. We see here in South Africa where Redefine took an awful hiding after its financial results this week. And the commercial property market 
with a big question mark over it, which could be another shoe to drop, as some people are saying. What, just maybe unpack that for us. Commercial property, why is it so relevant and could that spoil the party? It certainly could. I mean, commercial property is relevant because it's just a very large part of the property sector. And obviously, banks do a lot of the financing to to commercial property. And, you know, commercial property funds that need to refinance their, their loans and their debts are having to do it at a higher rate. And, you know, that could be an environment where their rates are under, under pressure, um, occupancies are lower. And so there's certainly going to be write downs that take place from the banks in terms of their loan books. But, uh, you know, on the positive side of that, post the global financial crisis, the regulationship is so um, tight on banks regarding regulatory capital and other things that, and we actually did an interesting analysis of this looking at but the overall banking sector in the US in particular, sort of following what happened in March, to say how well capitalized are these banks and their tier one capital ratios, which is a sort of core measure of how much capital they hold, are significantly higher than they were going into the global financial crisis. So they've got greater buffers. And remember, banks do provision for write downs and have been doing so during the course of last year. So they would have known that there's likelihood of write down. And so that provisioning would have already passed through in a lot of their earnings. So on the one hand, yes, you're going to see actual write downs occurring. A lot of that would have been provided for. Have they provided enough? You know, why would have to dig into each particular bank's, you know, earnings and, and balance sheet in more detail. But in aggregate, there have been provisions for this. The capital ratios are very strong. And we think that the banking sector is going to be fine. There will be these weaker banks, as we've seen regional banks that have mismatched their deposits with their investments and are potentially going to blow up. And therefore, the stronger banks are likely to pick up what the you know, market share from those banks. And we actually, as a result of our work, have tilted into the US banks with a particular ETF that's very overweight, the large, globally, systemically important banks. So the likes of Citigroup and JP Morgan and Bank of America, etc., where then they're likely to be winners where everyone else is suffering. So they're, they're certainly going to be paid. But I don't think the commercial property market would cause a correction to the same scale as subprime did during the global financial crisis. Um, you're seeing it now in Sweden. You know, it's a number of the banks there are having to do write downs and, and you know, cutting dividends and all the rest of it. So it's certainly going to, to cross the world. As you mentioned, redefine in South Africa. We're in a higher rate environment. So for us, this is not a surprise. It's what's expected. It's the same as a household. If a household has a mortgage or a student loan or a credit card debt or motor vehicle finance and your interest rates go up, it squeezes your back pocket. Um, and either you you know service that debt and stop spending elsewhere or you default. And so it's it's part of a normal cycle of high, hiking rates. But on the, posit- on the flip side of that, this shock we've seen in the banking sector in the U.S., could cause the Fed to pause, which we think they, they will now pause. Market expectations, however, are saying the Fed are going to have cut you know, more than half a percent, up to 1% by the end of the year. We don't share that view. We think they'll pause maybe throughout the year. But the point being that because of that and these tightening monetary conditions, you could see the Fed pivot to be more dovish and in so doing drive markets higher because everyone's now bullish again, oh, the Fed are going to be cutting rates. It's accommodative. So perversely, this negative news that we see today in banks and when it's commercial property or elsewhere could cause central banks to pause or reverse course on their hiking. And therefore, we see a market rally because everyone says we're at the end of the hiking cycle. And that's sort of the camp we're in, actually. The big elephant in the room really is inflation. If inflation doesn't continue to come in, and fortunately it is coming in, as we've seen, we saw the US inflation print this week, you know, came in around 5%. Um, inflation is trending downwards, but if it doesn't move closer to that 2% target within the next 12 months, we're going to have higher rates for longer. And that will eventually squeeze the economy. Again, so many moving parts. You mentioned earlier, sell in May and go away. That's an old, uh, uh, old timers used to mention that in times gone past. I'm not sure that the history, recent history would justify it, but we're in May. So should we be selling and going away and coming back maybe next year, given that we've already got 8% growth in equity portfolios so far this year? Our view would be no. You know, one needs to have, if you, it depends on your time horizon. If you're about to buy a house and you need the money you've just made to pay for your deposit in the next six months, I would sell now, capture that gain and, and save the money for your house deposit. 
if your investment horizon is for retirement or for your kid's education or north of five years, let's say north of 10 years, absolutely not. You need to invest throughout the cycle and remain invested. What one should perhaps do in your overall portfolio is just think about where the risky elements are and say, I've got a lot of growth stocks here that trade on high multiples. Maybe I'll rotate those into more defensive sectors um, and, and reposition the portfolio, but not sell all your equities. Um, and that's sort of the way we're thinking about it now. We've been you know, moving in towards growth sort of second half of last year. I mentioned the NASDAQ 100, which has got a tech orientation, but blue chip technology, large companies, mega caps, et cetera. And we're now moving some of that exposure into, for example, European healthcare, which is much more defensive, big pharma companies. You know, people need healthcare throughout cycles. Their earnings will, of course, oscillate, but generally speaking, more defensive sector. So it's about repositioning your portfolio, not just selling equities and waiting, because in doing so, you might miss another 5 or 10% rally. If the Fed do turn to dovish and, and talk about cutting rates, markets could easily run another 10%. So, and, and coupled with that, you know, and, and maybe where we're wrong on our tech move to, to trim back a little, is that tech stocks are growth stocks. And so the higher interest rate environment hurt them. Similarly, if we move to a more dovish environment with rates cutting, tech stocks can continue to run more. But from a valuations point of view, they've run very hard, very quickly. They're back to fair value. And there are other pockets in the market that we think look cheaper. What about artificial intelligence? You did mention tech a moment ago. All around the world, artificial intelligence is the next big wave. I saw it in Davos. We've seen it this week with Palantir's results coming out. They are positioning themselves as an artificial intelligence play. Share price jumped 23% on that news. Is there any ETF, given that you guys are ETF specialists, is there any ETF that you could recommend for someone who wants to get a little bit of a, a exposure to this? There are some AI ETFs, and we started to see um, a lot of emails hit our inbox from product providers relating to these. I won't you know, give a particular one a plug because we haven't done enough work on the, on them, but to the ones we've looked at sort of briefly, and this sort of speaks to all of them, is that they tend to hold a lot of big tech companies that have AI within the firm. So, you know, whether that's a, you know, a, a, a meta or it's an alphabet, and, you know, the, these big tech companies have AI units within them, and are working on projects and have been for years, they're often doing it through that play. But in reality, you're just owning a big tech company that has AI arm. And I think, you know, in terms of AI, it's certainly going to be disruptive to many aspects of the world and, and a net positive, ultimately. Um, you know, the jury's out on what happens to humanity because of AI. You know, I'm not going to delve into that topic. Everyone can read for themselves about the very differing views on this. I think there's going to need to be big regulatory reform on AI. But I think smaller firms that aren't able to use AI effectively or develop their own internal AI might suffer because of the success of the big firms in implementing and using AI effectively. So it's definitely a way in which I would suggest people invest in AI is by looking at the big firms that are already doing it and doing it well and, and own stocks or ETFs that, that give you that exposure. Um, it's still early days. You know, it's like, it's like the internet. You know, the internet was a, a big thing and you know, many internet companies in the tech bubble went bust and went to zero, but the, the top five or ten percent that survived today are big internet businesses. So it's it it will be like that, I think, with AI. You know, the investment that, that you need to in, in developers, in the hardware, in the processing, and the you know, all the rest of it means that you you can only really see big firms need in that area because startups have been struggled to get the funding. Artificial intelligence, the next big thing. Well, we do see in the business portfolio, we bought NVIDIA, which is the pick and shovel um, supplier of the artificial intelligence gold rush. That's done incredibly well this year. We've also seen Microsoft do very well. Amazon pick up nicely just on the, the, on the margins that they're involved in artificial intelligence. If you look at the overall business, it's a very small part of what they're doing. But one that that uh, that we have invested in in our portfolio, in our model portfolio, and it hasn't really moved, is IBM. Now, it's interesting if you go back and you think about artificial intelligence 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they, had, uh, they were developing things in that area, investing in that area. But it seems as though maybe they, they stalled, maybe they, they're behind everybody else, but it isn't really, hasn't really picked up as an AI play, that one. 
Yeah, I mean, we don't follow IBM that closely, but you know, from from my memory in, in knowing the stock, it's it's become a little boring, to be honest. Um, it's not the the that growth stock you saw in its its early decades of life as a company. Um, today, IBM is a you know sort of stable, dividend paying blue chip tech company. It's it's in our mind not a, 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 an AI growth company. Um, so you know, I, I can't comment on the AI. I haven't followed that story closely enough. Palantir, another one that we have in the portfolio, which is an AI play. But what you can comment on are the exchange-traded funds that we have in the Biz News portfolios. And we've got the Japan Index Fund. So park that one side. The Europe Financials ETF. And we even have a um, South Africa Index, which has not done well lately because the RAND has blown out again. Every now and then the RAND seems to take an awful hiding. Uh, which I'm sure for your South African clients who've invested uh, with you through London, um, they will be feeling quite relieved that they've got a hard currency exposure. But maybe we can start with the Japan Index Fund. Is that something that within your portfolios you have an exposure to? It is, Alec. We have, we have a slight overweight to Japan. Not not too large, but we, we have an overweight to Japan. We like the region. We like the whole of the Asian, Asian region in general because it's growing faster than a lot of the West. So, you know, Japan will be beneficiary of broader Asian growth. Um, you know, you've got a new central bank governor now, hopefully, uh, you know, some positive sentiment from that. Um, you know, Japanese stocks don't look overvalued to us. You know, they they trade slightly below their long-term averages. So we, we overweight Japan too. Um, banks in Europe, uh, different comment there. Europe, interestingly, and this is just an anecdotal fact, we were looking at major indices as of the end of April, starting from the beginning of last year. And Europe has been, so we looked at the DAX in Germany, the DAX 40, and the stock 600. And they're the two best performing indices in our universe. And that's crazy because if you go back to this time last year, we had had an invasion of Ukraine by the Russians, you know, war taking place, energy prices skyrocketing, and everyone worried about Europe and the impact of energy prices on Europe and the war. And fast forward to today, it's the best performing area of the world. So very interesting that, that Europe's done so well. We, we were overweight the DAX and European autos. But as pertains to financials, you know, I just find there, there are too many factors that, well, we're seeing it now with US banks, but there are too many factors that impact financials in Europe. You know, there's all the legacy stuff, which has been cleaned up over the last decade plus since the 2011 European sovereign crisis. Um, you've seen a lot of banks be split up to the, sort of the, the old dirty bank and the clean bank. Um, we've seen the woes of of um, Credit Suisse and the UBS merger recently. Um, European banks have become, in our view, a little boring. Um, you know, so we we wouldn't work, we we wouldn't overweight European banks, but Europe as a whole, we like South Africa. We don't invest in South Africa directly. We do it indirectly through some of our broader EM exposures. Um, so we haven't owned South Africa. The problem, as you know, well known, and your listeners will know, is that the South African indices are very international in nature because a lot of the companies are dual listed. And so you actually get a lot of foreign revenue when you own the top 14 South Africa. So you, you, you get a lot of overlap with the FTSE 100, with the big resources companies. So if you wanted to be overweight resources, you could either do it in a direct play, you could do part of that through the FTSE 100. We wouldn't necessarily need to do it through South Africa. Um, in terms of South Africa, though, you know, from a growth point of view, I think everyone's feeling the pinch from the, you know, the, what's happening with electricity and the delivery of energy to, to households and, and business. And that's a big dampen in our GDP growth. And it obviously hurts company margins when they have to make plans to put in solar and UPS and diesel and generators and all the rest of it that comes with it. So our view on South Africa would be that growth is going to be muted. So owning the South African index for me would, would be more owning a bit of international and then you hope that the periphery benefits from some domestic growth, but that domestic growth is under pressure. So we wouldn't be overweight South Africa. Just to close off with, you've mentioned boring IBM, you mentioned boring European banks. Well, what's not boring? What's exciting to you right now? I mean, one has to be thoughtful about getting caught up in the headline of a particular theme. Um, but, you know, things like the, the clean energy revolution is, is exciting. You know, there's a lot taking place there. Um, clean energy ETFs have actually come off recently, but had a very strong year last year as everyone thought about how the world will more urgently need to re have, you know, have less reliance on places like Russia for their energy and move towards clean wind and solar and all the rest of it. So... 
clean energy is, is something we think longer term is quite exciting. Um, you know, we've we've previously owned uh, esports and gaming, which is a, a, a massively growing market. I mean, it's a very competitive esports is a very competitive, let's call it not industry or uh, niche area, but it's no longer niche. It's bigger than the NFL, and people don't know that. You know, gamers and p- people watch people gaming. You know, that's just crazy to me. As I mean, I'm not old, but I'm not that young. But the, that whole gaming revolution and all of the, the ancillary companies that fall part of that ecosystem, whether that's game developers, whether that's the NVIDIAs and the chip developers, there's a whole ecosystem in the semiconductors. So esports and gaming is quite interesting. Um, and then, you know, artificial intelligence, but I think a lot of the companies that are direct plays trade at ridiculous valuations now, so one that needs to be careful with that. Robotics is another one. So, you know, automation in general is something that's sort of new. You know, automation has been taking place for decades. But there's an art, sort of a theme attached to it, and you know a lot of the Japanese companies you spoke, you know, speak about Japan, are very big in robotics, and I think robotics continues to to develop. So there, there are pockets throughout the world that one can look at, um, that are that are quite exciting to us. But you know you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes owning European autos like we've done is boring at the headline level, but if you look under the hood. A lot of the companies are very innovative and moving to electric vehicles. You know, Tesla led the charge in electric vehicles. And now if you're seeing the big German and other auto companies around the world built for, make fantastic cars, design fantastic cars that are electric. Um, so there's a lot of excitement happening often within boring sectors and companies. Um, what just needs to understand that. Mark Birchtold is the founding director of Omba Advisory and Investments. And I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. Thank you.